Welcome back. All right, so this is one of those videos I make in, in response to comments I see online. And the comments seem to be, well, yeah, the Canucks will be able to score goals. They'll have the goaltending. But that blue line is, is terrible. Now, I've talked about the blue line for years with Vancouver. But this past season, under Bruce Boudreau, things got better. And the Canucks were not a team that had a problem keeping the puck out of their net. Now, with Demko being so high profile as he is... Um, a lot of the credit is given to him, and I'm not going to argue it shouldn't be. Uh, he also, this past year, uh, really held back on some rough starts. He had really rough starts a couple of years ago that dragged his numbers down. Uh, Demko was excellent. We'll talk about him at the end of this. But I want to talk about the difference under coaches, and it's not just the record. So under Travis Green, they were 8-15-2. They allowed four or more goals nine times over that period, which is 36% of those 25 games. Uh, they scored four or more goals six times, which was 24% of those games. Under Bruce Boudreaux, their record was 32, 15, and 10. Uh, they allowed 16 times. They allowed four or more goals, which was 28% of their games. So right there, that's an 8% difference. They scored four or more goals 25 times. And again, this is according to my count. I went through every game, and that would be 44% of the games they played. So understandable that people look at their scoring and say, well, they were clearly a better scoring team. But overall, at the end of the year, their goals for was 18th. Their goals against was 8th. So they were top 10 in goals against this year. And I'm not trying to take anything away from Demko. I just think that sometimes this blue line gets a lot of hate that I don't know that it necessarily deserves. So Quinn Hughes is the guy on the blue line. 2027 is when that contract expires. There are Canuck fans when he signed that last summer. He immediately said, great, we're going to lose him in six years. That's the spirit. Uh, 76 games played last year, 8 goals, 60 assists for 68 points. And it feels like we're just scratching the surface with Hughes. Hughes could be a defenseman who could get to that 80-point mark. Maybe he gets there this year, right? Uh, 25 minutes and 15 seconds of ice time on average. He is the horse on that blue line. He's a very good defenseman who is getting better defensively as time goes on. Um, I'm not saying he's fantastic, but he's getting better. Oliver ekman Larson is also signed till 2027. What a difference the contracts make. Um, ekman Larson, of course, there's a lot of discussion about his contract. And, and hey, I said before they got him that getting that contract would be an awful idea. They get it. And now they're kind of stuck with it, right? But in 22 minutes and 19 seconds of ice time per game, over 79 games, he put up five goals, 24 assists, 29 points. Now, ideally, ekman Larson would be putting up about 40, right? Ideally, he'd be scoring a little bit more. But I, I don't think he hurt them so much last year. I thought OEL had a decent year. And as the year went along, he got better. And I thought when Hughes was out, that ekman Larson stepped into that spot and did quite well. So I would think this coming season, uh, Boudreaux will probably deploy both of them on the power play. I would think that uh, ekman Larson may get more than that 22 minutes and 19 seconds of average ice time. And then you have Tyler Myers, and of course his contract, everybody points to, that contract expires in 2024. Over 82 games, he had a goal and 17 assists for 18 points. Offense is not his game. Uh, 21 minutes and 58 seconds of ice time. Myers is there to be physical. Does he sometimes cross the line? Yes. Is his contract too expensive? Also, yes. But I think Myers this year, I thought he had a better year this past season than he did the year prior. So I'm not concerned about the point totals. That's for Hughes and ekman Larson. With Myers, I'm thinking along the lines of the physicality and just playing good, solid defense, right? Uh, Luke Shen has been very good for the Canucks. His contract expires at the end of this coming season. In 66 games, 5 goals, 12 assists, 17 points. His ice time, 17 minutes and 12 seconds on average. So this top four... I, I think is is a decent top four. I'm not putting it top 10 in the NHL. I'm not trying to even argue that this is a blue line that's going to bring the Canucks to the promised land. But I don't see a blue line here that necessarily costs them a playoff spot. Uh, I think this team's going to score more than they did last year when they finished 18th in goals four. I don't see a reason why Boudreaux, with the styles that he, he coaches and with the way that he runs the team, I don't see any reason that the goals against should be outside of the top 10 in the NHL. Right, So you've got Demko plus the systems that are put in place by Boudreaux should help to keep those goals against down. There may be some games for the Canucks this year that are not exciting to watch, but it should keep the goals against down. And then you get into the depths. So you've got Kyle Burrows, 
Uh, only played 12 minutes and 56 seconds on average in 42 games of goal and four assists. Um, he won me over as the season went along as a decent number six guy and as a fill-in, right? Uh, obviously, you don't want him in your top four necessarily, but I thought he played well. Uh, then you got Travis Dermott, who a after the trade to Vancouver only had a goal and an assist over 17 games. His average ice time this year between Toronto and Vancouver was 15 minutes and 20 seconds. So for Dermott, I thought it was kind of a bit of a rough start for him. He's a, a restricted free agent next summer. Uh, and there's some pressure on him because you got Noah Juleson had two assists in eight games. He played 14 minutes and 40 seconds on average when he was called up. I thought Juleson was a decent fill-in. And again, that's all this is, is the fill-ins. And then there's Jack Rathbone. And if you're a Canuck fan who believes in Jack Rathbone, this is a make-or-break year, right? He only played nine games last year. He played 13 minutes and 49 seconds worth of ice time. And so the argument can be he needs to play more. The other argument could be he needs to show he deserves to play more. And that's a whole argument we have with forwards, defensemen, goaltenders, you name it. The argument of he would be more effective if he played more. And then the counter argument of then why isn't he able to force himself into the conversation for more minutes? So we'll see if Rathbone makes the lineup. And then you've got Tucker Pullman. And they're still not sure on when Pullman's going to play. 40 games, a goal and two assists for three points, 17 minutes average ice time. And it's a contract I think the Canucks would like to move on from. All right, so uh, Pullman contract, the ekman Larson contract, the Myers contract, these are what are left over from the era of Jim Benning. Myers contract's gone in 2024, Pullman's in 2025, ekman Larson's in 2027. And this is key when you're looking to the future. So there's a lot of discussion about being able to re-sign Horvat um, that's now surfaced because now they've got Miller done. But I, I think there's enough contracts here that, that are going to expire. I think there's enough wiggle room here that if they play it right, they can still re-sign Horvat. So they brought in Christian Willannon in the offseason. Nine games, a goal, and an assist. He'll be UFA next summer. Uh, 14 minutes and 41 seconds worth of ice time when he played in the NHL. They may envision Willannon as being a good number seven defenseman, maybe a third-pairing fill-in. Walt Kalanick they bring in. Five games played last year in the NHL level, 11 minutes and 59 seconds. He's a restricted free agent next summer. And then two to keep an eye on. First off, Jet Wu, who had, I thought, a decent year in Abbotsford. Maybe Jet Wu gets some time with the Canucks this year because he's a restricted free agent next summer. You want to see what you've got. So I would expect him to get a lot of ice time in the preseason. And then maybe the ace in the hole. And I think one that's been kind of forgotten because of so much being done in the offseason. A number 24 pick in 2018... Philip Johansson, signed by the Vancouver Canucks, may end up being a very good signing. So he's a number 24 pick four years ago, meaning the Canucks don't sign him because they don't envision him making the team. In the event that Philip Johansson makes this team, it immediately makes that top six better. So this is a team that doesn't have a great top six. I don't think they have a terrible top six either, though. Uh, and with Demko, the interesting thing with him is the quality starts number this past year, and I got this from Dauber Hockey. 54.7%. What's interesting is the season before, he had a, a quality starts number of 54.3%, and it was actually 55.6% in 2019, 2020, but he had a lot of really bad starts as well. And the really bad starts uh, add up quickly, and that's what'll kill your, your save percentage. So the numbers for Demko, I really think part of it is that people were paying more attention to Vancouver than normal. Canuck fans could tell you over the last three years, Demko's fantastic. But this past season, there was more attention paid to Demko than usual. And there was a lot of discussion about whether or not he should be in the Vesna conversation. And he may very well be. But if you believe that Demko is that good and he can steal games and he's that fantastic, you know, in that fantastic game stealer category, and there aren't very many goalies that are really, really good at doing that. There are a few. But if you believe that, and if you believe that they're going to score some goals and still be able to have that offense run and... The other qualifier that I find odd is people always talk about how horrible and terrible the Pacific Division is. Well, then the Canucks should be able to move up if the division is as poor as people think it is. Um, but again, uh, it, it is going to be interesting to see if these numbers hold up because if they can put up numbers similar to what they did under Bruce Boudreaux after he took over. And again, the difference is remarkable that in 25 games under Green, they had 15 regulation losses. The rest of the season, they had 15 regulation losses under Boudreaux. He doesn't he doesn't like losing Bruce Boudreaux. So, and I've seen the argument too of, well, they'll just make the playoffs and get killed in the first round. Canuck fans just hear, oh, we're going to make the playoffs. Cool. 
because seeing some kind of upward momentum, some kind of, I don't know, glimmer of hope that the future could be good for this team is big. And being able to keep your core guys is a big part of that. Showing other players on other teams, hey, you know, Vancouver takes care of its players and guys want to play there. Uh, that's important. And yes, would you ideally add a top four defenseman here? Sure. But in order to add a top four defenseman, they're going to need to have some cap space, which they don't really have. And of course, the cap for next year is a whole other challenge for them to deal with at that time. But we don't know what might happen, right, between now and then. So there you go. Just a, just a relatively quick, by my standards anyways, in the offseason video on the Canucks blue line. And I, I think that there's a lot of, I, I understand that there's a lot of people at point and go, I wish they'd improve the blue line. Hey, the Canucks, in all likelihood, if you put them under oath, would probably say we really wanted to improve the blue line more than we were able to do. But they want to compete. They want to be able to make the playoffs. And I think they'll have a decent chance. Again, it's going to be uh, a matter of how they start. Another rough start. They're probably done early. Uh, and then there's whole other conversations we can have at this time. But for me, on paper, I don't think it's a defense that costs them a playoff spot necessarily. And so we'll see how it goes. Let me know your thoughts regarding the Canucks blue line on the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through you just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.